It is now my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Phyllis Sagano. I suspect many of us already feel we know Dr. Sagano. She has been a ubiquitous and tireless advocate for women deacons over the years. We've seen her on our Zoom and TV screens at conferences and public meetings, so much so that she's even been described as the Queen of Deacons herself. <laughs> it's true. Dr. Sagano is an internationally acclaimed Catholic scholar and lecturer on women's issues in the Catholic Church. She's written and edited more than 20 books, many of them on the role of women in the Church, especially the role of women deacons. She is senior researcher in residence and adjunct professor of religion at Hofstra University in Hampstead, New York. However, what you may not know about Dr. Sagano is that she has three master's degrees, spent 31 years in the US Navy, and between the years 2016 and 2018, when she was a member of the Papal Commission on Deacons, she lived in the Pope's home in Casa Santa Marta for almost five months. <laughs> you may also be surprised to know that while Dr. Sagano lives in the United States, she is, like the US President Joe Biden, who visited us this week, very proud of her Irish roots, Tipperary. In fact, Dr. Sagano is an Irish citizen and she holds dual citizenship. Please give a very warm welcome to Dr. Phyllis Sagano. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you so much. You know, you know, the joke is that the uh, Holy Father hired a Navy public affairs expert and propaganda expert to talk about women deacons, but we won't go there. Uh, I was a reservist for 21 years as a public affairs officer. Thank you so much, Ursula. It's so wonderful to be home, like Joe Biden, you know? It, I, I, I choke up too. I, th I think maybe when an Irishman moves to America, they learn to cry better. But. Um, uh, it, it, my uh, grandparents would be happy. My dear great-great-grandfather, Michael Kerwick, who was uh, dead in a ditch in Tipperary somewhere after the black and tan got him, uh, and, and all the rest of my family. So, um, you know, I, I don't know if the Catholic Church will restore women to the ordained diaconate. I only know it can. So we're, we're gathered here to reflect on the theme of women and ministerial service in the Roman Catholic Church. We're a synodal church, so my effort is not alone. We've been asked to discern about many things. Central to all, I believe, is the role of women. We, we can look to the past, we can look to the present, and we can look to the future. You know, these, I think, are the mileposts for our synodal journey on the question of women and ministerial service. You know, each is important only insofar as it is rooted in the teachings of Jesus as we know them through the Gospels, and, and I think each will help us find our path. With a nod to St. Ignatius, let us ask, what, what has the church done? What is the church doing? What can the church do for Christ and for his people? So, so what has the church done? Well, as you've heard, most of my academic research and publication is about women in the ordained diaconate. Women deacons, as Father Poitier has pointed out, once were well known in various parts of our churches, east and west. And they finally disappeared during the 12th century. And there was one 12th century bishop named Odo or Otto or Otoni in the ancient Etruscan territory of Lucca who didn't get the memo. <laughs> he ordained women as deacons through his seven year episcopate between 1139 and 1146. Now by the 12th century, uh, the practice of ordaining women to the diaconate had virtually disappeared, and it was not only women deacons who left the clerical stage. By, by the 12th century, the church had all but abandoned the permanent diaconate as, the diaconate as a permanent vocation for men and for women. The diaconate was absorbed into, as we've heard, the cursus honorum, the course of honor, the stages or steps, if you will, for a man and only a man, to rise to the priesthood. With the cursus honorum, 
the once permanent vocations became ladders of progression. Tonsured men advanced through the so-called minor orders, porter to lector, to exorcist, to acolyte. Then, then these men, only men, were ordained to the major orders in the sanctuary, to the major orders of subdeacon, deacon, and priest. Virtually no one, no man, certainly no woman, was ordained a deacon unless he was destined for priesthood. And the practice became law, as we've heard, and despite some effort during the Council of Trent to restore the diaconate as a permanent vocation, the practice continued through the mid-20th century. Then, then the Second Vatican Council considered several proposals about the diaconate. Now, responding to calls from deacon circles outside the council and from bishops inside the council, the council fathers discussed the diaconate as a permanent vocation and moved to restore it. The council vote on the diaconate was specifically on paragraph 29 of Lumen Gentium, the dogmatic constitution on the church, the content of which was divided into five sections, sections 35, 36, 37, 38, and 39. And restoration of the diaconate as a permanent vocation passed easily. Bishop voted to restore the diaconate as a permanent ordained office with only 242 bishops opposing. And this vote followed a more positive vote on the deacon's tasks and duties. And the other successful votes were on the need for papal approval for a bishop to restore the diaconate in his territory for the diaconate to be conferred on married men. And then there was one more, a very interesting ending to the story of these votes for Lumen Gentium 29. While the diaconate was restored and approved as a permanent vocation for married men, in another vote, 800 bishops voted against imposing celibacy on younger unmarried men who would be ordained as deacons. Now, that's more than one-third of the bishops voting that day in 1964, voting against the church practice of forbidding ordained men to be married, ordain, forbidding ordained men to, be, to marry. So, the diaconate was restored as a permanent vocation for married men with Pope Paul's apostolic letter, Sacrum Diaconatus Ordinum, June 18, 1967, which called the diaconate a third rank of sacred orders. That date actually, I, I read, it was the feast of St. Camillus uh, de Lellis who created a diaconal work of Hospitaller uh, in Rome. Anyway, new rites for all the ordinations showed up one year later with the apostolic letter Ad Pacendum in 1972. Pope Paul ex uh, ex suppressed the minor orders Porter, lector, exorcist, acolyte, suppress them, and the major order of subdeacon, designating their duties to be conducted by installed lectors and acolytes. Now, the question of restoring women to the diaconate did arise at the council. A bishop from Italy and another from Peru asked about it, but restoring history then found little, if any, support. For more than 50 years, the question of restoring women to the ordained diaconate languished. Then, in May of 2016, Pope Francis attended his second triennial meeting of the International Union of Superiors General, the UISG, um, the organization of some 1,500 heads of women's religious orders and institutes around the world. At the first meeting he had attended, just a few months after he was elected, he gave a prepared speech to the women. But for this, this meeting, the second meeting in 2016, they asked if he would respond to their questions. And he agreed. And so questions were sent in advance over to Casa Santa Marta and different sisters asked them at the assembly. Now the first sister asked for a better integration of women in the life of the church. Francis admitted that women's input to decision-making was weak. 
Specifically, he said that, quote, when there, when there is no jurisdiction arriving, deriving from ordination, that is, pastoral jurisdiction, it is not written that it cannot be a woman. The fuller answer to this question came six years later, in 2022, with the Apostolic Constitution Predicati Evangelium, which allows for laypersons, male and female alike, to hold even major positions in the Roman Curia. That is, women can be included in management. But the second question was more to the point of our discussion today. The title of the new apostolic constitution, after all, is Predicati Evangelium, Preach the Gospel. The second question the USG sisters asked was, quote, what prevents the church from including women among permanent deacons, as was the case in the primitive church? Why not constitute an official commission to study the matter? His answer was positive and positively stunning. He said, I would like to constitute an official commission to study the question. I think it would be a good thing for the church to clarify this point. So. Francis's answer brought me and Father Poitier and a uh, few others to Rome six months later in November of 2016 for the first of four meetings. I had my first dinner in Casa Santa Marta on American Thanksgiving Day. Uh, there were 12 persons named to the commission. I understand it was the first pontifical commission made up, as we've heard, of an equal number of men and women, six priests and six women. We met in the meeting rooms of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Our final meeting occurred in June of 2018. What do we do? <laughs> well, that's hard to say. As far as I know, none of us has seen the papers sent to Pope Francis by Cardinal Louis Ladaria, the prefect of the Congregation, now the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith. We received only a copy of Francis's acknowledgement of something in July of 2018. Then in May 2019, at another triennial meeting of the International Union of Superiors General in Rome, Francis gave their president what he called, quote, the little they, that is us, that agreed upon. He said the sisters could publish what he gave them and that they could ask him for other commission documents. Six months later, the newly elected UISG president told the online journal Global Sisters Report that the previous UISG president, Carmen Samud, had received the history portion of our work. Just last May in 2022, UISG Executive Secretary Sister Patricia Murray, an Irish woman, IBVM, now soon to, I think, BCJ, uh, told me, quote, it was only the history. The bottom line, it does not appear that UISG will publish this history portion of our report, despite Francis's advice that they were free to do so. So that was then. <laughs> this is now. What's the church doing? We are in the middle of an historic church-wide synod on synodality. We have been asked to discern how best to proceed toward a future in which we will better preach the gospel. The question, how can the church, communion, the whole church, participation, act, mission, in the light of the spirit, that is a tall yet extremely exciting order. And the Synod on Synodality process is reporting concerns from around the world about the place and status of women in the church. What can we learn from them? Well, I can tell you about the United States. In the United States, 41 diocesan reports do not mention women at all. Most dioceses that publish their reports, and may I point out that despite calls and claims for transparency, 15 of 178 U.S. dioceses, Latin dioceses, have not published their reports and 13 have only published a summary. In the United States, most dioceses that did publish full reports or summaries 
mention comments about the roles of women in the church. Among those, more than half identify the ordination of women as an issue, while more than 25% specifically talk about women in the diaconate, women deacons. And another interesting statistic, as I mentioned earlier, 41 dioceses don't mention women at all. I find that fascinating, absolutely fascinating, because the last time I looked, there were women in for those 41 dioceses. Um, anyway, the reasons for these mentions range from simple requests to include women in ministry as a por a, for a partial remedy for pre-shortages. However, the way the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops report voted the question of ordained women to Rome is, I think, illustrious of the pitfalls and difficulties of condensing an enormous collection of comments into one report. Now, for example, if you listen carefully, the, the, the question of women deacons in the United States synthesis that went to Rome towards the continental uh, document, they cite a certain region. They cite, they say they quote region 12, and this is what they write. People mention, quote, a variety of ways in which women could exercise leadership, including preaching and ordination as deacon or priest. Ordination for women emerged not primarily as a solution to the problem of the priest shortage, but as a matter of justice. Now, that paragraph is represented as a direct quote from the synthesis report for Region 12, the 10 far western dioceses and states of Alaska and Oregon, Idaho, Montana, Washington, which in turn, that synthesis report cites the Archdiocese of Seattle as the source of the quote. But there's a significant difference between what Seattle wrote and what Region 12 synthesis properly quoted, which states, the ordination of women as deacons or priests came up frequently. This topic emerged not only as a solution to the problem of the priest shortage, but as a matter of justice. And do you hear the difference? The, the important distinction, the emphasis in the national report, not primarily as a solution, but as a matter of justice, can evoke the image of women picketing in St. Peter's Square, demanding equal rights and equal rights. That is, the Seattle report, like so many US reports and the Region 12 synthesis report, emphasized both the need for more ordained ministers and also noted the question of justice for women, as well as for the church. Now, you know where we are now. Every Irish diocese published its synthesis report, and the Irish Bishops' Conference provided its synthesis of these to the Synod Secretariat in Rome. And the Irish Bishop Conference document notes, as you may have heard last night, quote, several of the submissions called for the ordination of women to the permanent diaconate and priesthood. Their exclusion from the diaconate is regarded as particularly hurtful. By my count, 21 of 26 Irish diocesan reports mentioned ordained women, and 11 specifically mentioned the ordination of women as deacons. So more than half of the Irish reports that spoke about ordination specified women as deacons. And the Irish report continues, quote, because of the disconnect between the church's view of women and the role of women in wider society today, the church is perceived as patriarchal and by some as misogynistic. Now, as you may know, seven continental assemblies met and either have produced or are producing their responses to the working document. They are being published even as, as I speak. The European gr group met in person in Prague. That included the Irish group, the Irish uh, delegation, that has not yet been published. But those for Asia, Latin America, Oceania, Africa, and the Middle East, including the Eastern Catholic churches, uh, I believe have been published. I was reading some of them this morning. Uh, despite opposition, despite opposition, I find this fascinating. Everybody else met in person. The United States respondents met only by Zoom. Now for North America, excepting Mexico, 
A US-Canadian writing team met in Orlando for one week at the beginning of March, and I am told they only began their writing on the last day of the meeting. Um, the other thing, let me, let me digress. What I am noticing is, in, worldwide, in the participation, the parish participation is highly lay, and, and that of other groups. The diocesan participation becomes increasingly clerical. The national participation even more heavily clerical. And the continental uh, participation is top-heavy clerical, uh, almost two to one. And then, of course, we have the synod, uh, which people are still calling the synod of bishops, and we'll see what happens there. The synod document, the Instrumentum Laboris, the first draft, uh, was being written this week in Rome uh, by a committee of seven, including two women. Um, now, in terms of the responses from some of the uh, continental responses, the response from Latin America uh, by Selam asked to create and, quote, institute new ministries for women and, quote, for the institution of a female diaconate. The Asian final document focuses on including women, quote, in governance and decision-making processes in the church, and, quote, for meaningful participation of women in all aspects of the church, but made no direct response to the working document's statement that the world asks for, quote, a female diaconate. Uh, the North American document asks for clarity about a co-responsible church and does use the O word, mentions the question of ordination. And in Oceana, uh, they say that one group asks for women's ordination as deacons and, oh, a minority concern was expressed that women were still barred from the permanent diaconate and ordained ministry. Uh, uh, when we have, get to the Q&A, we can go to some of the other ones that I was reading this morning. Um, unfortunately, reading them in French, so I, I can't quote them directly right now. So anyway, what can the church do? The terminology is important here. The working document that the continental phase uh, groups were responding to, the working document notes incorrectly, I believe, that the 112 national documents requested, quote, a female diaconate. That's paragraph 64. Now, does that mean restoring women to the one ordained order of deacon? Or does that mean a separate non-ordained order of women, quote, instituted to perform diaconal services? So I can tell you that in the 1980s, the second draft of an ultimately unsuccessful document by the bishops of the United States on women in the church recommended instituting women as deacons. So what can we do? What's next? We are in a liminal moment for the church. The question I ask is the question women around the world have been asking before, during, and since the synod completed its continental phase. When will women be recognized as fully human? When will women be recognized as made in the image and likeness of God? When will women be recognized as being able to image the risen Christ? These are significant questions. The Querelle de Femmes, the women question, was a debate about women, whether women were the same species as men from the late 1400s through the 1700s, the classical Aristotelianism held sway. Women were unable and incapable of reason. In 1538, John Knox wrote against women's political rule. By 1638, Anna Maria von Sherman wrote in the Netherlands that women should be, should be educated. Her book is entitled whether a Christian woman should be educated. And I find that eerily predictive of attitudes in some countries of the Middle East. One wonders as well if those attitudes reside within the walls of the Vatican. 
See, that's what the world is up against. We're, we're not in conversation only about restoring women to the ordained diaconate. We, we need to recognize that the implications of the abandoned practice are widespread and serious. The refusal to ordain women as priests, first in 1976, winter and signores, and again in 1994 with Ordinatio Sacerdotalis, overtook the question of restoring women to the ordained diaconate. Now, the first document, Inter and Signores, 1976, is an opinion rendered by the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, and it presented what is known as the iconic argument and the argument from authority. The iconic argument, as you know, only a male can represent Jesus. The argument from authority, Jesus chose male apostles. Now, the second document, 1994, Ordinatio Sacerdotalis, drops the iconic argument, perhaps, perhaps, in recognition of the fact that it was and is heretical. <laughs> the stunning fact of the incarnation is that God became human. The natural resemblance necessary for the sacrament of order is that of a human person. So we must admit today, tomorrow, and the next day, that women can receive the sacrament of order as deacon, just as they did for hundreds of years in the early church and from the inception of the formalization of ordination with its attendant liturgies, at least through the 12th century. That the diaconate was essentially on hiatus from then until the time of Vatican II robbed the church of the richness of its charism it cannot be overlooked that during the ensuing centuries, diaconal ministries increasingly became the purview of lay groups and especially of institutes of women religious. But the history of ordained women remains, and there is not now, and there never has been, any doctrinal finding that women cannot be restored to the ordained diaconate. That is, that the church has been wobbling over the question is a scandal. Some people dismiss requests for the restoration of women to the ordained diaconate when presented as a matter of justice, one of women's rights, insinuating it is a political discussion. But, but let me expand a little bit on that notion. Justice means justice for the people of God, not only for women. It is about ministry, it is about women deacons, it is about women being ministered to by women. I'll say that again. It is about women deacons, but it is about women being ministered to by women. And the question is not going away, nor should it. My own country echoes the cries of women past, present, and future. As U.S. Cardinal Robert McElroy wrote in Commonwealth Magazine recently, quote, the issue of women constituted a central focus of critique in the national dialogues. By way of example, the Cardinal cited the report from the Diocese of, La of Las Vegas, which noted, quote, broad support for ordaining women voiced by those participating in the synodal, synodal process as were calls to include women in leadership positions, discussions, and decisions on all levels of the church. And Cardinal McElroy concluded, the strength with which all of these ideas were expressed across every region in the country points to an enduring failures of the church to engage and treat women in a manner which justice demands. No picketing is necessary. This is not a political discussion. The Synod is a formal worldwide exercise in discernment. Hundreds of thousands of people have brought this and other questions before God. They have plumbed the inner movements of their hearts toward and away various thoughts, ideas, and feelings. What gives energy to them and to me now is the concept of restoring women to the ordained office of deacon renewed as it has been and as it has been becoming in these post-Vatican two days. It's about ministry. 
Can it be? <laughs> Will it be? Let me leave you with one thought. The council vote to restore the diaconate as a permanent office took place on October 28th, 1964. That would be the feast of St. Jude, patron of hopeless cases. Thank you. <laughs>